Valerie, and um, you have a beautiful facility here. And thank you all for coming. Um, if it was my choice, I'd be out gardening today. So, <laughs> um, uh, Between 2009 and 2012, archaeologists from the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, I'll call it ISAS from this point on, conducted large-scale excavations in East St. Louis as part of the New Mississippi River Bridge Project. This undertaking was a joint effort of the Federal Highway Administration, the L Illinois Department of Transportation, and the Missouri Department of Transportation. And our excavations focused on the area now paved over by the alignment of I-70. Whoops, there we go, right here. Uh, which crosses the newly opened Stan Mutual Veterans Memorial Bridge. Archaeological testing was initially focused on the prehistoric component of the East St. Louis Mound Complex, and this complex is located directly beneath the former site of the National Stockyards. Previous investigations have found that this complex was one, at one time the second largest Mississippian city in the world, second only to nearby Cahokia. ISAS investigated more than 6,000 prehistoric cultural features dating from the terminal late woodland through Moorhead phase Mississippian occupation, and that's circa 900 to 1300 AD. And so every single little, oops, whoops, let me go back there. The wrong button here. Okay, so every single little uh, black dot uh, that you see there is a feature. There's just one on top of each other. So, I'm actually not going to talk about that today. <laughs> what I want to talk about is a story a little less known, but no less significant. Whoops, hitting the wrong button. There we go. ISAS also investigated eight former residential areas associated with the late Victorian period, and three of these sites underwent intensive archaeological excavations. In total, over 250 historic features dating from the late 19th century to the early 20th century were excavated. Tens of thousands, and now I can actually tell you that number is slightly over 100,000 artifacts, were excavated from dozens of privies, uh, cisterns, wells, and cellars. And our discoveries in East St. Louis are important because we all have this notion of what East St. Louis is today, and it's really easy to superimpose that on the past. But around the turn of the century, this part of the city was a bustling, heavy populated, working class neighborhood. So today, I'm going to examine the research area at two levels. I'm going to look at the macro level and the micro level. And at the macro level, I'm going to talk about the growth of East St. Louis as an industrial hub, focusing on changes in transportation and other events that helped to shape the landscape of the city. Then I'll talk about the demographics of one of the research areas, Block 1, a neighborhood that developed to support industry and the expanded, expanding needs of the population. I'll also examine uh, boarding houses and boarding within that neighborhood. And then I'm going to narrow the focus to the micro level and compare two different types of households in the study area. So one was a boarding house, once known as the Mead House, located on block one. Um, let's see, right here. Let me go back, right here. The other is a sample associated with a long-term household located on block uh, 26. The homeowner was Elizabeth Benner. She lived here for nearly 30 years. So such a comparison between these two different types of households illuminates similarities and differences, um, as well as allows for a discussion about what daily life may have been like in this working class neighborhood in a multi-occupancy home and what types of services may have been offered there. The earliest Euro-American settlers to the surrounding East St. Louis area were the French missionaries who settled here uh, well they established a mission in Cahokia in 1699. And at this time, they encountered bands of Indians who were completely unrelated to the Mississippian people who lived at Cahokia. And when the future grounds of Fort St. Louis were founded in the 1760s, the people of Cahokia were using the land that would become modern-day East St. Louis. They were using it for agriculture 
as common land. St. Louis has been called the gateway to the west, but actually East St. Louis is the gateway to the gateway to the west. <laughs> East St. Louis was initially settled because it was an ideal point to cross the river to St. Louis, and by extension, the western frontier. Its growth was inextricably linked to St. Louis. As the population of St. Louis grew, more and more raw products and uh, uh, raw materials and produce from Illinois sought a market in St. Louis. First though, these products had to be transported across the river. The initial settlement of East St. Louis is due to the foresight of Captain James Piggott, who established a ferry here in 1797. He also built a few cabins, and it was Piggott's land that would eventually become Illinois Town, which later became part of East St. Louis in 1861. Uh, this ferry operation, though, only lasted two years because of his unexpected death, but it was out of his entrepreneurial spirit that grew one of the most successful uh, monopolies in the Midwest. Samuel Wiggins acquired it in 1817, eventually forming, forming the Wiggins Ferry Company. Uh, this ferry operation expanded dramatically, operating as many as 12 steamers and tugs across multiple routes between the two shores. Uh, during the first half of the 19th century, uh, flat bottom keelboats and rafts were the predominant type of vessel uh, to carry people and goods um, across the, the rivers. River travel was sometimes slow, especially upriver, because uh, speed was dependent on manpower and currents. Now, steamboats revolutionized trade on the rivers. The Zebulon M. Pike was the first steamboat to arrive to St. Louis in 1817, and in 1828, Samuel, Samuel Wiggins introduced the first ferry steamboat in East St. Louis. Now, the steamboat era in St. Louis, excuse me, the steamboat era in East St. Louis could not be compared to that of St. Louis or any other river city, but it was in East St. Louis where a new type of transportation um, was about to make steamboats nearly obsolete. And I'm talking about the railroads. Steamboats faced competition from the railroads in Illinois as early as the 1830s. The first railroad in Illinois was built from uh, Illinois town to the, uh, the Eastern River Bluffs in 1836 for the sole service of carrying coal from the River Bluffs to East St. Louis where it was transported onto one of Wiggins' ferries over to the markets of St. Louis. By 1865, five railroads converged in, uh, in East St. Louis, and by 1880s, this number had more than doubled to 11. Uh, this map, I think, is excellent because you can see all of these railroads coming in to East St. Louis and conver converging at the waterfront where they terminated and all of the goods had to be transported across the river. In 1874, uh, the Eads Bridge opened breaking the Wiggins Ferry monopoly, um, and now goods could enter St. Louis via East St. Louis on tracks. The development of this railroad infrastructure uh, in East St. Louis created a location that was suitable for the development of industry. And it was here the industries were free from the nuisance statutes of St. Louis, so they were allowed to make as much stink as they wanted to um, without uh, being fined. Industries like the St. Louis Bolt and Iron Company, Obear Glassworks, the Elliott Frog and Switch Company, American Steel, established factories in East St. Louis. Other upstarts included uh, paint factories, oil processors, grain and lumber mills, iron foundries, stone and brick works. East St. Louis was becoming this industrial suburb. It was becoming the Pittsburgh of the West. In 1872, the St. Louis National Stockyards opened. Its property was so large that it could accommodate packing house facilities, a hotel, an exchange building, a post office, a bank, and telegraph offices, to name a few. 
Um, the stockyards and its associated industries were really a driving force in this economy. And by the turn of the century, sales topped 2 million annually, and the stockyards employed 1,200 workers and processed nearly 50,000 animals per week. Factories also took advantage of the growing labor pool. Uh, census records indicate that in 1870, the population of East St. Louis was just over 5,000. By 1900, the population had increased to 30,000 and nearly doubled that by 1910. So up to now, I've largely focused on the growth of the city, but the landscape of East St. Louis was also shaped by many detrimental events. In 1896, there was a devastating tornado that uh, ripped through uh, South St. Louis and into East St. Louis. Um, as you can see in this uh, bird's eye view, uh, block one, which would have been right here, uh, was most likely impacted. Um, also from this photograph, this is uh, the National Hotel at the National Stockyards. Um, this is damage from that uh, um, tornado. Uh, block one was literally located across the street from this hotel. Now floods were also a major problem in the American bottoms. Uh, in 1903, flood water inundated much of the city leading to a series of canals, uh, the formation of the East Side Levy District, as well as uh, the declaration of high-grade ordinances within the city, which were intended to raise road levels up above flood, flood stage. Now, tax income within the city was also skewed because uh, the city relied most heavily on residential taxes. A lot of the industries that uh, established themselves in, in East St. Louis um, established themselves just outside the city limits, but they still wanted all of the benefits of living in a city. Um, so uh, um, it, what this meant, there was less money for the city. Services like water and sewer lagged behind. And this 1920 map uh, shows that Many residents in East St. Louis lived well into the 20th century without sewer and without water. Um, up here, this is uh, block one, and you can see part of the block had sewer, and I think most of the block had water at this point. Uh, just another number, uh, the author of this map, Bartholomew, Mew, um, he says that in 1920, there were 7,700 outdoor privy vaults in East St. Louis compared to only 5,000 indoor toilets. So that kind of gives you an idea. Now, social historians have written on how this town was a, a breeding ground for political corruption and uh, uh, you know, most of the city ordinances were put into place to benefit industry rather, rather than the actual people. Racial segregation was commonplace even well into the 20th century and tensions over work disputes culminated in the 1917 race riots. Vice abounded and sections of town such as the Valley and Whiskey Chute were home to numerous saloons and boarding houses that facilitated gambling and prostitution. Um, I will just add that uh, uh, many of the farmers that came in to go to the stockyards uh, came in through a, a train depot, which was down here. So to get to the stockyards to do their business, they had to go through here and right up St. Clair Avenue. So, and um, there's the mead house right there. After World War II, East St. Louis started showing signs of economic destabilization. Proximity to railroads uh, was less important as the emerging highway and trucking system was introduced. Uh, new business methods so showed value in decentralizing rather than co-locating, which is what we saw in East St. Louis. 
So East St. Louis prominence as this great industrial suburb as the Pittsburgh of the West was beginning to wane. And despite the rapid growth of East St. Louis and some of its growing pains, the working class people who lived here probably felt isolated from these larger forces at work. Um, they dealt with the fact that they didn't have water and sewer service um, by using wells and using uh, outdoor privies. And what that means for us is that the East St. Louis people, the working class neighborhoods, left a rich deposit of archaeological material for us to look at. Um, and really, you know, it's, it's this material, it's, it's a different type of history that we can tell. It's, it's one that's deeply rooted in the lives of the people who live there. But before I get to the heart of that story, um, I need to talk specifically about the study area. The project impacted the residential neighborhood of Goose Hill. Uh, Goose Hill, it was a working class neighborhood predominantly occupied by unskilled laborers who worked at the stockyards and the packing plants. Workers who earned a higher wage tended to live east of Goose Hill and south of Goose Hill um, in Lansdowne Park or south of St. Clair Avenue. Uh, the stockyards are right there, and there's the Mead House. Uh, Goose Hill was first um, settled by Irish immigrants in the late 19th century. Um, there were also uh, some blacks that lived there after 1890. Um, around the turn of the century, uh, a lot of the Irish immigrants began to move out and they began to seek out um, better living conditions. And that's when the Eastern Europeans came in and they were the ones who were willing to work for the low wages in the packing houses. Now block one was located uh, next to the National Stockyards and the people who lived on the block one, uh, more so than anyone else in the Goose Hill neighborhood, would have regularly heard the animals in the pens, uh, the squeals from the slaughterhouses, uh, the noxious odors from the fertilizer plants and the rendering works. However, living here also had its advantages. If you were poor, you could just walk to work. You didn't have to worry about paying for public transportation. In 1900, only 20% of the residents on Block 1 owned their own home. And by 1910, this number decreased to 17%. And in 1920, only 9% of people who lived on Block 1 owned their own home. Most people rented and most people lived in boarding houses. Now, the term boarder refers, refers to a non-kin member of the household who receives bed and meals in exchange for money. And some families took on one or two boarders. Others were, entire, were completely dependent on the money, the income that boarders brought to their, their household. And there were also many different types of boarding houses. Mechanic boarding houses were typically those that housed working class men. Um, uh, they're common on the coast uh, for sailors. Um, up in Michigan, you get uh, um, uh, lumberjacks. <laughs> uh, some boarding houses were also combined with saloons, and in this case, um, your uh, boarders and other patrons that would come in would socialize, drink, and eat in the saloon, and then the kitchen and the dining area were generally reserved for family use. And at the most extreme were boarding houses that doubled as brothels. Now, in between all of these, there were different classes of boarding houses, those that provided sparse furniture and served barely edible food, to those that had fancy rooms and served decadent food. And by the turn of the century, boarding was beginning to be associated with the lower class immigrants and became known as the lodger's evil. National reformers advocated the abolition of boarding house establishments, and despite this, Boarding was common in East St. Louis, with at least 15 properties on Block 1 having borders, and of these, eight housed three or more people. Now, during excavations on Block 1, ISAS investigated a boarding house that I will, from this point, call the Mead House. According to the 1896 Whipple map, uh, the Mead House was a two-story wood frame structure with a metal roof. It had a front porch and an L-shaped one-story extension attached to the rear of the structure. 
um, and that's marked shed on the 1905 Sanborn fire insurance map. Now this address appears for the first time in the 1891 to 92 city directory as the Mead House and it, at this time it was an all-male boarding house. In 1900, the, city, the 1900 city directory, it appears under the new name, the Maple Hotel. Now census data unfortunately was not recorded in 1900 for this uh, property. The 1905 city directory indicates that the property was still being used as a boarding house, but it didn't have a formal name. And the 1906 city directory, it was a privately run boarding house ran by Mrs. Lucy Davis. And Lucy Davis, she boarded people here until approximately 1914. Um, after this point, it was still a boarding house, but it's unclear who actually ran the boarding house. And the ex exact nature of this boarding house is also unclear because of conflicting terms in the historical documents used to describe the property. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, it's depicted as a tenement here. Um, in many of the city's directories, it's referred to as a boarding house, um, a, a hotel, a privately run boarding house. Um, but, you know, what we can say for sure is that people did board there. It's also unclear um, precisely how many people lived here between 1890 and 1920. Based on uh, the city directories and the census data, it, it's safe to say that upwards of 70 people lived here. During, during that time span. ISAS's investigations at the Mead House identified four privies directly beneath the shed, um, right here. Also, uh, two cisterns, which are these larger round features that you see right there. The locations of the privies and the cisterns suggest that um, this may have been some sort of wash house or bath house. Uh, the multiple privies also suggest, and also the features suggest that some of these privies may have been contemporaneous. So reasons for constructing more than one privy uh, uh, could be related to uh, sanitation, stability, access, or social boundaries such as male versus female. All four privies were wood-lined, single-shafted facilities with the exception of feature 36. Um, as you can see here, it has some sort of shelf. Um, it's possible that this was a separate uh, um, shaft, but as you can see here, these zones are going down into it. Um, if it was a separate shaft um, and these are lined, we would expect to see uh, perhaps some remains of some lining there. Um, we have seen uh, privies similar to this in other urban environments where um, uh, it's almost like, like a way of draining the privy. So your solids would get stuck here and then all your liquids would percolate down. Um, you can also see in these um, uh, profile maps, uh, the privies, the infilling of the privies is very complex, uh, but in order, in order to make things a bit more simple, we've divided uh, these zones into primary deposit, which is your primary privy deposit. Then you have uh, these zones that are in the middle, and it's kind of privy deposit intermixed with household trash, and really that kind of represents the abandonment of the facility. And then up here, you get these cap zones, and these cap zones, um, that's the orange, they're, they're almost like slump zones, and the material in these zones typically dates 20 years uh, later than what you'll find in the privy. And so what's probably going on is that over time, um, those soils and you know, all those organic matters in the privy are decomposing, and um, the soil begins to slump in. So whoever lives there is um, trying to even out the ground or whatever, so um, we call it a cap zone. Now, the features being relatively large holes in the ground, uh, typically uh, um, they were used as 
uh, trash receptacles, um, either during use or after use life. And once abandoned, they appear to be filled rather quickly. Um, especially where we find large amounts of artifacts with known manufacturing records. And using this information and using the layers and the features, we're able to assign a terminus post-quim, which I put that up here for you. It's the date after which a layer or feature was deposited. So um, overall, uh, the features range in dates between 1900 and 1911. Um, here you can see uh, the secondary deposits. That's that cap zone. Um, it's difficult, though, to pinpoint which of these deposits correspond with specific people who lived in the house, given the large uh, number of transient workers that lived there. What it does uh, tell us, though, or allow us to do, is it allows a window into um, what daily life may have been like in these multi-occupancy homes. But really, in order to facilitate such a, a discussion, I'm going to compare the sample from the Mead House to that of a sample associated with a long-term household located on nearby 20, Block 26. And that is right here, 819 Bowman Avenue. The homeowner was Elizabeth Benner. Um, she lived in the home for nearly 30 years with her daughter, Victoria. And the house appears on the 1905 Sanborn map uh, as a one-story L-shaped structure with three porches and two outbuildings in the backyard. And there's your outbuildings. While Lizzie did rent part of her home and housed a border at some point in time, it seems, seems reasonable to assume that the archaeological sample here most closely reflects her consumption patterns. Now, Lizzie Benner first purchased Lot 17 for $600 in 1892. In 1896, Lizzie sold the rear portion of the lot to Joseph Zermanek. Her home appears to have been subdivided inside, uh, with Lizzie and Victoria living in one part and a series of renters living in the other part. The renters included a carpenter and a caretaker. Lizzie was a first-generation German-American, born about 1870 in Illinois. She was the widow of John Benner, who died of tuberculosis in 1894. John was a public school teacher and a tax collector, and John Jr.'s father, John Benner Sr., was the proprietor of the Benner Livery and Undertaking Company of East St. Louis. Lizzie was listed as having no occupation in either the census or the city directory data, uh, perhaps her rental income was enough for Lizzie and Victoria to live on. Now, by 1910, at the age of 17, Victoria was working as a forelady of a dry goods store, and also in 1910, they had a boarder living in the house with them. Um, the boarder, his name was Bird Asbury. He was a packing house laborer. Now, Lizzie lived at 819 Bowman Avenue until at least 1920, uh, after which she moved in with her daughter, who had recently married. ISAS's excavations at the Benner home identified five privies and two cisterns in the backyard. The privies were located directly below and adjacent to the outbuildings along the east side of the lot. Now, feature nine uh, was likely a double seater. Here you can see in the zones you have a, a clear distinction of the two different shafts. Um, it seems also likely um, that a few of these privies uh, were replacement facilities, though there was likely some overlap in when they were open. Um, again, uh, contemporary privies can uh, be an indicator of social boundaries. In this case, um, you know, I mentioned before male versus female, but in this case, we could be looking at renter versus owner or border versus homeowner. Unfortunately, the, the excavation of the cisterns was problematic. Um, we actually had to halt excavations due to large voids in the fill, and so we don't have um, uh, profile maps of those. But uh, this is what your underground cistern would have looked like. Um, when these were filled in, they just didn't get filled in all the way, and it created unsafe conditions for our field people. Um, but what I can say about 
these cisterns is that uh, you know you have two different sizes here. Uh, feature 18 was um, the older one. Feature 16 was built to replace feature 18 sometime around 1816. Um, feature 16 was closed sometime around 1819, possibly when Lizzie Benner vacated the property or when the house was outfitted with, with um, running water. Um, we know this because cisterns are typically filled very quickly. You don't find um, artifacts are generally not thrown into cisterns while they're still in use because many people use these as drinking water, um, especially at, uh, in East St. Louis. Uh, we didn't really find that many wells. So by comparing the Mead House sample to that of the Benner household, similarities and differences uh, between such different living conditions reveal themselves. And such an approach can also facilitate a discussion about some of the services that may have been offered at the Mead House. The refined ceramics of the Mead House indicate that food was most commonly served on white thick body wares, and this includes plain white ironstone uh, wares as well as white molded wares. And even though undecorated wares were fashionable during the mid to the late 19th century by the 1880s, really these undecorated, undecorated wares were fading out of popula popularity. Um, despite this, hotels and boarding houses preferred plain wares because their thick, bulky construction and durability appealed to such service industries. They were also super easy to replace. Um, you break a plain white plate, you can easily go buy a plain white plate. The Binner household used a greater variety of decorated wares than that of the boarding house. Decal wares uh, were the most common, um, down here, followed by plain and white molded wares. Decal wares were introduced around the turn of the century and they quickly gained popularity. And some scholars have suggested that fashionable and highly decorated wares can serve as a way of negotiating an identity in reaction to social and political and economic circumstances and an increasing involvement in consumer society. So Lizzie is buying more and more wares that are more, I guess, fashionable is what I'm trying to say. She was a fashionable lady. <laughs> Now the boarding house sample contains a higher number of serveware items. When I say serveware items, I mean platters and serving bowls compared to tableware items, so, so plates. Most boarding houses serve food at a common table, and this can be indicated by this higher number of servingware items. Um, it's suggestive of community dining, uh, family style dining, and such vessel complexity suggests that the table may have been set quite formally at times. Uh, and this is uh, based on unique vessel forms like uh, a compote, a relish dish, a toothpick holder, and even a celery vase. And yes, the celery vase was intended to hold celery. Um, the presence of the celery vase was just surprising. Um, celery was actually considered a delicacy at this time, especially because there was no uh, refrigeration. Um, now, as for the binners, uh, they still used a variety of serveware forms, but it was no, nowhere near as high as that uh, of the boarding house. Now, interestingly, uh, both the boarding house and the meat house contained a higher number of uh, serving bowls, which is ind indicative of um, soups and stews and other liquid-based uh, uh, meals as opposed to uh, your roasts and your things served on a platter. And perhaps the best indicator of what types of food was actually served on the table is revealed in the funnel analysis done by our very own Steve Keen, who's sitting over there. Um, <laughs> now both the, the meat house and the Binner household had a dietary reliance on uh, uh, pork, beef, and chicken. Uh, now note the relative amount of chicken, and this number is skewed, and I'm going to talk about that later on in my presentation. 
Now, both households consumed some wild game, including uh, bird, fish, and rabbit. A bird includes uh, a turkey leg, uh, which was not that unusual. Um, however, a tibiotarsus fragment from a double-crested cormorant was found in the Benner assemblage, um, and that is kind of unusual. The fish may have been locally obtained uh, through fishing or secondarily from a local market. Cottontail rabbit may have been hunted or trapped by one of the residents or purchased at a local market. Uh, this is a 1914 photograph of a nearby grocery store. Um, it depicts uh, rabbits for sale right here on the floor. Um, they're displayed in a box. Uh, now, some people consider rabbit a delicacy. I don't even want to eat it. <laughs> An analysis of retail value cuts of meat indicate that round steaks were most commonly served at the meat house, followed by cross rib and front shank cuts. And the right round steaks are, uh, sorry, the round cuts, they're relatively thin and probably represent uh, steaks rather than roasts. And spending on steaks as opposed to lower valued meats in the boarding house uh, suggests that, uh, well, it was, for one, it was surprising, but it also suggests that uh, some of the food served at the boarding house may have included individual portions, uh, not just like uh, communal type uh, bowls of food. Um, and that's something that you find in, in uh, higher class boarding houses. So that's why I say it was surprising. Um, and the fact that uh, you know, they were eating steaks, um, it wasn't expected, but one thing, after I thought about this, uh, one thing that could be happening is uh, the people who lived uh, or who worked at the stockyards, perhaps they were bringing steaks home from work. Rather, if their boss knew that, I don't know, but um, <laughs> I guess they could put it in their pocket and walk out. <laughs> Still, uh, no one eats steak every night, and analysis indicates more pedestrian ways of cooking as well. The meat and bones from beef shanks could have been used in soups and stews, which corresponds with the larger number of serving uh, bowls that I mentioned earlier. And one of the most common dishes served at boarding houses was called boarder's beef. And it's kind of like a, a beef stew or a boiled beef. Uh, it doesn't sound very appetizing to me, but such coarse meats were generally uh, preferred by working men clientele who valued quantity over quality. Um, and the serving of a food in a way that facilitated family style meals out of these serving bowls and platters suggests that the boarders were at least partially incorporated into a community with whom they lived. Now as for Lizzie Benner, uh, mid-value cuts of beef and pork predominate in the Lizzie Benner household. Um, higher value pork cuts like loin were consumed less frequently. And really this suggests that the Benner household was populated by those of moderate economic means um, and possibly share similar dietary preferences. And the presence of a large number of food product bottles recovered from both households may be related to an attempt uh, to dress up these cuts of meat or at least make them bearable to eat. Mustards, condiments, extracts, and pickle, ball, pickle, pickle bottles comprise a majority of foodstuffs in both households. The meat house, though, has a wider vi variety of products compared to the Benner household, including baking powder, chow chow, salad dressing, and various sauces. And one common assumption is that uh, a higher number of condiment bottles indicates that the food served was bland. Uh, perhaps food was made bland so that it could be seasoned to one's taste. Given that this property was a multi-occupancy home, uh, cooking bland food and providing a variety of condiments to put on your food would have been a way to satisfy everyone's tastes at the table. A large number of alcohol bottles and uh, drinking vessels indicate that alcohol was consumed on both properties. Now, whether the meat house served alcohol or the alcohol was consumed privately is less understood. Although I did mention earlier that some boarding houses also doubled as saloons. 
And the large number of alcohol and beer bottles, as well as the presence of 34 tumblers, and that's actually a, a very large number of tumblers in an archaeological sample, um, support the notion that beverage service may have been offered here. Alcohol bottles include beer bottles, spirit bottles, uh, wine champagne bottles, and such consumption patterns uh, with a higher number of beer and hard liquors are more similar to uh, kind of an upper south background um, or those who immigrated from the upper south. Now, like the Mead House, the Benner household also consumed beer, though in smaller relative quantities, as well as wine, champagne, and cider. And this consumption pattern may be a reflection of ethnic descent, though um, these numbers are really small to make that argument. Um, alternatively, the absence of any hard liquors in the Lizzie Benner household may reflect uh, the house policy of Lizzie Benner herself. A majority of the beer was locally or regionally produced, including Falstaff beer, manufactured by the Limp Brewery, as well as Stettner and Toma Weiss beer, both of St. Louis. Interestingly, uh, four cigar jars were also found at the Mead House. Um, here's one of them. C cigar jars held not one cigar, but many cigars. And uh, they're interesting because uh, the proprietor of the boarding house could have sold them individually to patrons. Uh, after all, many men that I know enjoy a drink and a celebratory cigar. Um, alternatively, there may have just been a resident that really likes cigars. Let me go back just for one second. Now, uh, both sites actually contained a large number of flasks. And flasks, flasks were items that you could keep on a person. Um, they could also be re, uh, refilled. And some scholars argue that a, flat, a large number of flasks in an assemblage can indicate that drinking alcohol, at least hard alcohol, uh, was not publicly accepted. And so people are disposing of these flasks in the privies in order to hide their drinking habits. Um, at other archaeologically investigated boarding houses, this was more common with beer than it was with um, flasks. Um, you know, th this argument, I could go either way on this argument, but I feel that at this point, the ubiquitousness of glass um, is, at this time, uh, you know, I just don't think that this argument can be made. I mean, I wouldn't make that about pickle bottles. They're trying to hide the pickles in the privy. It doesn't work. Now, other beverages consumed at uh, both the Mead House and um, uh, the Lizzie Benner household include soda and mineral waters. Soda and mineral waters were non-alcoholic beverages with plainer carbonated water and often some sort of artificial or natural flavoring or sweetening agent. The difference between the two was often very vague. Now, the earliest soda and mineral waters uh, were primarily consumed for medicinal uh, purposes, though by the second quarter of the mid-19th century, these products were being enjoyed as flavored refreshments. A majority of the bottles uh, that we recovered were local products uh, from East St. Louis. So we have Spanigal, Meyer, um, Huffschmidt. Um, they're real common soda manufacturers. Now, it's difficult to speculate how these households were finished, furnished because most furniture is made of material that decays in the ground, um, but there are a few clues. At both houses, there's evidence for uh, furniture in the form of caster wheels, doorknobs, spittoons, and oil lamps. And the Mead House also contained fragments of a very large mirror. Both households were growing uh, plants, whether decorative plants or herbs, in flower pots. And at the Binners, though, uh, uh, an intact prism from a chandelier was found. And it's a, a prism like this, uh, it was intact, it wasn't broken. Um, prisms like this can easily be repaired on whether it's a lamp or a chandelier, so it's kind of puzzling why this was actually in the privy. Um, 
you know, it could have happened that a child or a renter broke the prism and in order to conceal what they had done, um, swept it up and put it in the privy. Uh, that's just a fun little guess. But what this prism indicates is that Lizzie Binner could afford some of the finer furnishings that others could not. At the Mead House, uh, the cleaning of the premises and chamber service uh, would have been the responsibility of the boarding house operator. Uh, this would have included the daily cleaning of chamber pots and uh, wash basins. It, it may have also included uh, putting fresh water into um, pitchers for the wash basins. While several chamber pots, uh, wash basins, and um, pitchers were recovered from the meat house, probably the best evidence for chamber service is in the form of this waste bucket. Now, waste buckets, uh, they would have had a handle. This is actually very large. Um, my scale doesn't do it justice, but I mean, we're talking this waste bucket was, you know, this big. It would have had a handle on a lid. Um, it would have been carried from room to room. You empty one uh, chamber pot into it, um, and then you could carry it outside and deposit the contents wherever they needed to be deposited. Um, interestingly, the only other waste bucket that we found in the project area was also at another boarding house. <sighs> yeah, this is my favorite ad ever. Um, now health conditions in this industrial town were poor. Pollution uh, and harmful fumes contaminated the air and workers often put in exhaustive hours at work. And these conditions often led to accidents, chronic illness, and disease. Self-medication was common. Uh, during the turn of the 20th century, there were a large variety of medicines available that claimed to cure everything, um, from flu to tuberculosis. Now, cure-alls may have been used to alleviate uh, aches and pains, or even to erase the previous night's work from one's consciousness. And while some of these may have worked, others were rather addictive because they, they had ingredients like uh, cocaine and heroin and alcohol and um, opium. A majority of bottles from both the meat house and the Binner household consisted of unembossed plain bottles or local druggist bottles. The most common proprietary medicines at the boarding house were castoria, cure-alls, and extracts. And at the Binner household, extracts, tonics, and liniments were the most common. Specific products uh, include Grove's Tasteless Chill Tonic, Sloan's Liniment, and Radway's Ready Relief. Syringes were recovered from both properties. And when I say syringes, I'm not talking about hypodermic needles. The syringes depicted here had specific uh, purposes as seen in the J.P. McElroy catalog. Um, typically, these syringes were used for uh, the treatment of venereal diseases such as gonorrhea and syphilis. And they could actually be evidence for sexual promiscuity, uh, perhaps even within the household itself. Historically, we know that the Binner household included at least two women, uh, Lizzie and Victoria, but uh, little is known about the women who actually lived at the Mead House, especially prior to 1905. Archaeological evidence for women at the Mead House was indicated by a significant number of products associated with female grooming and hygiene. Evidence for well-groomed hair is in the form of combs and hair treatments a Pond's cold cream jar and a Heinz honey and almond cream bottle would have been products that help with the female complexion. And the presence of 18 perfume bottles suggests efforts at smelling good, or at least covering bodily odors, which probably was important in close quarters like the Mead House. By comparison, only two perfume bottles were recovered from the Binner household. So 18 perfume bottles is a very significant number.
Historically, there's no evidence for children living at the Mead House, but we found evidence for infants and nursing mothers in the form of uh, this glass breast pump, which doesn't look very comfortable, um, <laughs> a nursing bottle, infant medicine, and uh, baby food right down here. Evidence for children includes toys like marbles, uh, doll fragments, a toy glass commode. Uh, this is a, uh, oops, let me go back. This is a rubber doll, and it actually, um, dolls similar to this were sold in the Sears catalog, and you could squeeze them and they would go, mama. <laughs> um, a toy glass commode, which is very unusual. I've never seen one of these, but the doll and the commode could have been used to help potty train a child. Additionally, uh, five children's shoes were found at the Mead House. And while uh, the presence of toys can really go only as far as saying like the children played on the property at the Mead House, uh, the fact that we found shoes in the privy is a, a very strong indicator that they actually lived there. Uh, throwing away children's shoes would have been an act most likely initiated by a mother or a caregiver rather than the children themselves, unless they were really bad children. Um, children would have grown out of shoes uh, quite quickly, perhaps requiring new shoes every year or so. Now, historically, we know that uh, Lizzie had one child, Victoria, and excavators recovered uh, this transfer printed alphabet plate, uh, several dolls and marbles. In a recent study of Germans in Sacramento, California, German families were found to inculcate Victorian ideals uh, of independence, frugality, industry, and hard work into their children through messages inscribed on children's dishes. Girls could also learn lessons about domestic responsibility to their families through dolls and tea sets. And for those of you who are animal lovers like me, the final assemblage from the meat house revealed a few more unexpected borders. The landlord or, tenement, uh, or tenants kept pets. Now, two dogs were found in two different privies. None of the dog remains display butchery marks or evidence of pathology or trauma. And the dogs likely represent household animals or pets discarded in the privy after they died. And this is not an uncommon thing. We've also seen uh, cats and dogs and privies out in Boston. And lastly, remember uh, the skewed chicken in that chart that I showed you earlier. Uh, the presence of several chick bones and eggshells egg suggests that chickens were raised at both the meat house and the binner home. And while both households did consume chicken, the lack of any medullary bone, which is kind of, it's not really a bone, but it's a bone characteristic. It's kind of a bone within a bone. And it's only found in egg-laying hens. Um, uh, it suggests that egg-laying hens were not routinely consumed. So in conclusion, the Mead House, through a portion of its history, served as a male boarding house. Archaeological evidence supports that children also participated in the lives of the boarders and may have even resided, resided within the home. And a variety of services may have been offered here, including family-style dining, beverage service, and chamber service. Overall, the boarding house seems to have offered a balance in quality of service. Uh, it's unclear if this quality changed over time, but perhaps that's something we could look at in the future. The Lizzie Binner household, on the other hand, uh, displays evidence of uh, disposable income in the form of fashionably decorated tablewares, uh, a preference for, high to, for mid to high value cuts of meat, as well as fine lighting fixtures like a chandelier. In conclusion, the, the Mead House and the Lizzie Benner household represents, they represent communities within a community. And with it, within each household, our findings show distinct approaches to home life. Taken together, they show the variety and vibrancy of the community and life at the time. Thank you.